recently I was helping some friends buy some arcade machines for a local arcade and one of the machines that was available for sale was this moon base cocktail table. Nobody seemed to want it and the seller was only asking $200 for it so I decided to buy it for myself as a fixer upper. Now as you can see it's a very different style of cocktail table as compared to Omega Rays or Rally X. In fact you could just about use it like a real table and put your feet under it. Admittedly, I don't care for the control layout, but hey, this is from 1979, so they really didn't know any better at the time. Anyway, uh, let me plug this thing in and I'll show you what it's doing. And yeah, one of the first things I need to do is replace this horrible plug and cable. So um, when it fires up, it looks almost like a scrolling message, but uh, that's actually because the CRT is rolling because it's out of sync. And uh, you can see a bit better with the lights off, but... Um, also, you can probably see the geometry of the screen is pretty messed up. I think it needs recapping. Also, as you can see, it is a clone of Space Invaders. Uh, in more ways than one, too. I found this photo of the official Space Invaders cocktail table, and it looks more or less identical. I'm not sure how much of the hardware is the same, though. Um, let's take a look around back. Um, I noticed there's an electrical info plaque, which says it runs on 100 volts, which uh, makes no sense unless it was meant for the Japanese market. Uh, maybe this one was modified for the USA at a later time. Anyway, the um, legs on this thing are a bit rusted, so I'm hoping I can polish these up and make them look nice again. I found a Texas Comptroller sticker on the side. Um, these were required for any machine that accepted money, and uh, this one expired in 1983. So I thought that was the last time it was in service, but around on the other side, I found another sticker, this one from 1984. Speaking of taking money, um, this is the coin door, but I don't have the key to this, so I'm not sure what I'm going to do there. So, I'll need these keys here to open it up, and this is where I encountered something rather odd. I put in one key, and it doesn't work. So, I put in the other key, and it does work. And then I go around to the other side, and I find that uh, this key doesn't work, and I have to use the first one. So, basically, you need two keys to open this thing. Sort of reminds me of the scene in War Games where they had to turn both keys. Or a similar scene from Superman 3. <laughs> anyway, so here it is. Uh, the first thing I notice is how absolutely dusty it is in there. Um, some items are completely unrecognizable. And man, what a huge transformer that is. One interesting thing is this little pocket here which contains the service manual. Well, that's something you don't see these days. Uh, it contains a full schematic of everything. And I noticed there was both an upright arcade in addition to the cocktail table. I noticed the motherboard, which is actually three interconnected boards in a little module, is not even screwed down for whatever reason. Um, the screen is, of course, actually a monochrome screen. Uh, it has some color filters placed over it in order to make different parts of the screen appear different colors. And believe it or not, each of these is a completely different piece, so this isn't just a single sheet stuck on there. I think I'll go ahead by removing the motherboard module, and even though this part is still working, I will take a more detailed look at this later on. But, for the moment, this frees up some space on the inside, so I can get a better look at things. There appear to be two analog boards on either side of the screen. Uh, the left one is the power supply for the motherboard, and the right one is the monitor board. I'll start by discharging the CRT, which is actually a bit difficult to do because of the way this thing is put together. But anyway, I managed to do it, so I think I should be safe to handle the CRT now. I'm going to unscrew these support frames, and I think the CRT will come out together with it. And it does, except that uh, I forgot to unplug the neck board, so uh, let me do that. And let's try again. There we go. CRT is removed. I'll set it face down on this towel here until I'm ready for it again. I'm pretty sure this thing needs recapping, but it's so dirty inside I can't even read the values. Oh, and look, I found a dime in here. Not sure how that wound up there. A quarter would make more sense. This one's from 1980, which was probably the year this unit went into service. I was also curious what this device was, so I rubbed the dirt off and realized it was a coin counter. So uh, we know that this unit was played over 16,000 times. Another bizarre feature of this unit is the service outlet. It's basically a plug where you can connect tools or diagnostic equipment or whatever you need when servicing it. Anyway, time to dust this thing out so we can actually see what's in here. All right, let's take another look inside now. Oh, wow, 
it doesn't even look like the same machine. You could actually read everything. Well, I think the first thing I should do is go ahead and remove this little board for the monitor since I want to replace all the capacitors on it. It's a surprisingly small and simple board. Speaking of video, I noticed the video connection was just two wires. I would have expected separate sync signals and such, but it appears to be composite. So I've plugged in a little header here so I can get the signals and do a little experiment. So I've hooked up this little Apple II green composite monitor and now I'm going to power it on and interestingly enough, uh, there is a picture there. It's a little dark even if I set the brightness to high, but if you turn the lights out in the room you can totally see the game playing on here just fine. So I've taken the board back home to my studio where I'm going to recap it. I had to remove this one cap just to be able to read the values since it was up against a heat sink. The next thing I'm going to do is put a dot on top of all of the old caps. and This helps me remember which ones I've changed out and which ones I have left to do. Oh, and um, here's the box from Mauser with all of my new caps. And um, you know, the sad part is I think I spent longer figuring out which caps I need to order than it actually takes to solder them in place. Anyway, let's get started. Okay, one done, now I just have another 20 to go. Okay, so I have most of the new caps in. Uh, notice a few smaller ones still have dots on them because it turns out I ordered the wrong thing. But the small ones are the least likely to have failed, so I'm just gonna leave them for now. And here are the old caps. Uh, let's have a moment of silence while we thank you for your decades of service. I will mention that there are some other capacitors on this board, such as these uh, metal film capacitors, but uh, these are unlikely to have failed, so I won't be replacing those at the moment. Okay, so I went back to my brother's shop and started to do a little cleaning. I mean, I figured if I was going to see this thing work, I didn't want to have to look through dirt to see it. Okay, time to reinstall the analog board I just recapped. And of course the CRT. And last, the motherboard so that we have a video signal. And so here's the first power on test. The good news is nothing blew up or let the magic smoke out. The bad news is uh, the picture looks more or less the same as before. You can see it a little better with the lights off in the room. Of course, I knew I was going to need to adjust these potentiometers, but uh, I was sort of expecting things to look a little different. Anyway, I tried adjusting all the settings and I found essentially three problems. Uh, problem number one is I couldn't get the screen to stop rolling. I could get it to roll one direction or the other, but not stay still. Problem number two was I couldn't get the horizontal or vertical to expand to the edge of the screen. And problem number three is I couldn't get rid of the barrel distortion. Uh, this here is about the absolute best I could get it adjusted, and it's still rolling ever so slightly. But I think there's still a problem with the deflection system, and I just don't know what to do. So, I took the board back out and took it home. Uh, one thing I wanted to test, which is pretty easy to do, is the vertical hold adjustment pot. Uh, somebody has suggested it might be part of the problem. After desoldering it, I connected it to my meter and measured both sides of the thing and found that it was working perfectly, so I soldered it back in place. Um, well, so here goes some far more in-depth troubleshooting than I had really planned, but on the bright side, this board is divided up into sections and each section is labeled. So we have sync in this section, video over here, uh, that has to do with the source signal. Uh, horizontal is here, vertical is here, power up here in this corner, and believe it or not, audio. Uh, but this section is unpopulated as it was not used on this board. So we can pretty much rule that out. And I think we can also rule out the video section as well as these potentiometers down here. Uh, which leaves us with um, a problem in one of these places. And and I've already recapped the board, which means there's only a few suspects remaining. Oh, and I did eventually get those smaller caps replaced too. So uh, the next thing I did was to desolder one leg of every diode and resistor <laughs> so I could lift them off the board and test them with my meter. And they all checked out fine. So as you can see, there are very few suspects left here. So I decided to try replacing the one integrated circuit on this board, which is smack in the middle of the vertical section of the board. I went online and attempted to find the original part, but couldn't, so I found a cross-reference part. 
Unfortunately, I couldn't get to the screws on the heatsink because this large capacitor was in the way, so I desoldered that capacitor so I could temporarily remove it. And then I went to town removing this thing. Um, after getting the old part out, I noticed it had this blackened look to it as if it were burned. Although it could be corrosion or who knows. Anyway, I applied some heatsink compound to the new chip and put it in place. Then I installed the board back into the cabinet for about the 40th time. And the CRT. Okay, so I can't find the footage of me testing it after replacing the chip, but to be honest, there's not a lot to see. Uh, basically, uh, the board went from working very poorly to not working at all. I mean, the screen was completely black. My first thought is that I probably just didn't get the right component, that it probably wasn't compatible, but I wasn't really sure. And so at this point, I was, I've was i been working on this project for months, and I was just kind of at my wit's end. And one of the biggest problems that I had was that I didn't have any way to fire up this board outside of the cabinet. So every time I wanted to make a change to this board, I had to spend 20 minutes reassembling it back into the cabinet. And then when it didn't work, another 20 minutes to pull it back out. Uh, so basically, every time that I wanted to test anything, you were looking at 40 minutes of work. Because, of course, once it was in the cabinet, it was virtually impossible to reach anything on it. Now, had I known from the beginning that it was going to take this long and this many tries to get it working, then I would have probably taken everything out of the cabinet and set it up on a bench so that I could work on it, which would have been very time consuming, but would have saved time in the long run. But each time I pulled this board out, I just secretly hoped that whatever change I made, this is going to be the thing that fixes it. And then it never was. So I got to thinking, who does have the ability to fire this board up? on a bench and work on it where it'd be much more convenient. So I thought about Adrian Black. So I asked him if I could send him this board along with another working board that I had pulled from another arcade. He said he would definitely be able to test it with one of his CRTs, but uh, he would at least need the deflection yoke from uh, one of the tubes. So I removed the yoke, boxed it all up, and sent it to Adrian. Uh, many of you may have already seen the episode he did on his channel troubleshooting it and what he found. And it didn't take him long to figure out the mistake I made. Okay, I am seeing an issue. So this is the original part, this NEC part. There you can see is pin one. It has a little dot and it has a stripe painted on the package as well. Now the Samsung one here, the original stripe that might have been on there is gone, not to mention there's no particular dot. So what is pin one exactly? Well, in absence of a stripe or a dot, I'm going to say that the beveled edge, which you can see it's far more beveled on the left side than on the right side. I'm going to say that that is pin one. You can see the writing is facing us and that notch is towards the left on the picture. But look at the silk screen marking there. You see it says 10. And on the other side, there is a notch and a one printed on the silk screen marking, which would indicate that that part is in backwards. An image. No, I can't see. All right, vertical size, vertical linearity. <laughs> Would you look at that? We have, if I switch this, a good looking pattern. It's actually totally working. Okay, so apparently I was this close to getting this board working. And um, I wanted to talk a little bit about my mistake. So first of all, admittedly, I have never installed a single inline package like that before. I've done dip packages a lot, but never the SIP packages. So I really wasn't even entirely sure how to tell which direction that they went. I was going to base it off of these, which side had the text on it. And the interesting thing is that actually would have worked, but somehow or another, um, I misremembered which side it was on when I went back to solder back in. It's kind of like one of those things where have you ever been, you pull out of a parking lot onto a road and you think you're driving north and then after a minute you realize, oh, I'm actually going south. Of course, that probably doesn't happen a lot these days because everybody's using GPS, but you know what I mean? Like if you've been driving for like 20, 30 years, you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, I'd like to mention something else. Every time I make a mistake and I show it in one of my videos, I get like totally roasted down in the comments section, mostly from armchair warriors who for some reason expect me to do everything perfect the first time. And so I just wanted to point out that I am human. I do make mistakes. And I want to show you this little video clip. The greatest teacher failure is. The point being here, I learn from my mistakes. So I definitely won't make that same mistake again. And uh, by showing it on video, other people can learn from that mistake too, and hopefully won't repeat or make the same mistake that I did. 
And I think the only time people really deserve criticism from their mistakes is when they either don't own up to it or admit that they made one or um, when they don't learn from them. So anyway, moving on, the next thing I need to do is take this board back over to my brother's shop, reinstall it in the machine and cross my fingers, hope it actually works there. Okay, time to put this thing back together. And as much as I'd like to say it's for the last time, I know it won't be, but uh, I need to test the monitor now. Okay, all back together, let's plug it in and test it out. Well, the screen is going crazy, but I probably need to adjust the controls. And look, there we go, it's stable, but also very blurry. I think the brightness is up too high, let me fix that. There we go, that's looking good. Um, unfortunately, as you can see here, I think the yoke is slightly crooked. I don't really like sticking my hand in there to move the yoke while it's running, but it is the only way to get it adjusted right. So, uh, yeah, I think that's about where it needs to go. And also, I didn't get shocked, so uh, great news. Next thing I want to do is replace this gnarly power cord. So, I went down the street to Home Depot, and uh, they actually have power cords that are perfect for this type of thing. As you can see, um, it's just a plug on one side and some tin leads on the other. As you can see, the old cable had a knot in it to keep it from being pulled out of the machine, but more importantly, it has a little connector of some kind on the end that I don't have a proper replacement for. So I'll feed the new cable in here and uh, tie a knot in it like before, and then I'll salvage this old connector. And there we go. And I'll fire it up with a new cable. Excellent. I also want to fix this coin box. I think somebody tried to pry it out, probably because they didn't have the correct key for it. My first attempt to fix it was to put some wood on either side and put it in the vise. And that made about it 50% better, but not fixed. So I tried again, this time using tape over the metal to protect the paint. And there we go. Um, I'd call that fixed good enough. I do need to remove this lock so I can replace all of the locks on the machine with new ones. I also need to clean it a bit, and there we go. I also need to remove these control panels so I can work on them. Unfortunately, they are using a very annoying type of bolt that is totally flat on one side. I'm sure that was done for security purposes, but it is a pain to get them off. But I finally succeeded. So I need to do a few things to this, including cleaning this gunk off, uh, see if I can tighten this joystick up, and last, see if I can fix this broken wire. I'll also need to take this rear panel off for similar reasons. You can actually see all the way through the cabinet at the moment. And next I'll work on cleaning these rusty legs. I saw a YouTube video where they used a magic eraser on Chrome and had good results, so I'll try that. And well, it didn't seem to be working that well for me. In fact, I didn't think it had done anything at all. But when I went back and looked at the footage and compared before and after, I realized it did make some difference after all, it just didn't fix the rusted spots. Oh, and I need to make a modification. Uh, since this machine is never going to use coins again, and the motherboard doesn't support a free play mode, I'll need to add a button to simulate a coin. So I've made up a button that says free play on it, and I'm thinking this would be the perfect spot for it. So let's make a hole. And here's the button. Basically, I just removed the wires from the coin slot mechanism, and I'm going to solder them straight to this button. And now to test it. When I press the button, the coin counter should respond. Yep, that's working. I also need to do some general cleaning to the outside of this machine, and uh, I'm willing to bet that most of that is cigarette smoke from back in a time when indoor smoking was allowed. Anyway, time to get this gunk off the control panel. Okay, that definitely looks a lot better. Time to do the rear panel. Now, I wanted to investigate this wobbly controller, and I think I just need to tighten that nut. So I took the mechanism apart and found that the nut was as tight as it would go, so what I eventually realized is that, well, that's just how this thing was designed. It has some slop in it. Oh well, um, I guess we'll leave it that way. 
Now, this button here, which by the way is the one player button which you need to start the game, uh, has one of the pins broken off. Um, I tried to find a replacement button, but I can't find this model anywhere, so the best solution I could come up with was just to solder the wire to what's left here. The last thing to do is put new locks in so it no longer requires two separate keys to open it. Okay, here we go. This is like the 50th time for me to reinstall this thing. And at this point, I have some very bad news. I test played it for about 10 minutes, and suddenly the monitor broke again. Um, I didn't get any footage of it when it happened, but now it's back to doing the exact same problem again. Uh, you cannot imagine how disappointed I was having worked on this for about four months now. I wanted to show it off completely fixed. I mean, what am I supposed to do now? I've just claimed this is a new rolling mode to make the game more challenging to play. <laughs> I mean, other than the monitor, I'm really pleased with how everything else turned out here. Okay, so where do we go from here? Well, I've invested way too much time to just give up on this project, so I want to see it through, but it's obviously going to have to be a part two. And that's partly because I would like to call out to the audience to see if there's anybody who can offer any suggestions. The way I see it, there are three paths forward for getting this uh, thing fixed up. Uh, one option would be somebody who knows how to repair it. I mean... Clearly, I mean, me and Adrian both repaired it, but it, that was not a permanent repair. There's obviously something else that's causing that chip to burn out. I could replace the chip again, but it, it's probably just going to burn out again. So we really need like a super duper monitor expert that either knows how to fix it or maybe knows where we can just find a replacement board. I mean, I've looked and I cannot find one. So option number two would be to simply find a 13 inch monochrome monitor somewhere that I can use as scrap and simply take the board and the yoke out of it um, and then you know modify the cabinet so that I could mount that board in there and then keep the original CRT. Um, option number three would be to replace the entire CRT and board with something from another 13 inch monitor. The only problem with that is a lot of the 13 inch monochrome monitors that you can find they're like either, I mean, they're monochrome, but they're usually like amber or green or something like that. And you really need paper white for this to work, especially with those color filters in order to get the, the faux color that it's supposed to have on it. So another option would you know, simply be to use like a television. If I could find a black and white television that had like a composite input or could be hacked to have a composite input, then that way I could get the white screen and, you know, the funny part is, it occurred to me, it could actually be a color television. I mean, <laughs> a color television will display a monochrome signal. It will still be white on the screen. So I could still put the color filters on there, and it would probably work just fine. So anyway, those are some of the possibilities of, of what we might do. And so I hope to follow this up with a part two. We'll just, we'll see what we can do to, to get it working. But uh, let me give you a little bit of teaser about what's coming up next. Uh, just in a few days, I'm going to be leaving for Chicago for Vintage Computer Festival. And I'll be covering that with a video later showing, um, you know, what all the cool things were that we did there. Also about to follow that up with a video on the Commander X16. I know a lot of you guys have been asking over the last year or two, you know, what's the update on that? Well, it's working. You see it here. It's actually playing Super Mario Brothers. This is actually a dedicated port. This is not an emulator. <laughs> and uh, I'm excited to show this off to you. Uh, we're, we're about this close to being ready um, to actually start manufacturing these things. So that'll be coming up soon as well. But that's about it for this episode. So as always, thanks for watching. <laughs>